this. And I am in good company here, joined by three scientists who have been studying how to build computers based on ideas that Einstein once called spooky. Computers that are orders of magnitude faster and more powerful than today's most souped up supercomputers. And I am no Einstein, but I have watched enough Star Trek to know that we are talking about quantum computing, without which the Starship Enterprise would never have reached those distant galaxies, or so I am to believe. Please welcome three of the intrepid explorers who might help us someday get to Cardassia Prime. Scott Aronson, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Matthias Troyer, Professor of Com Computational Physics at ETH Zurich. And Krista Savori, Manager of the Quantum Architectures and Computation Group at Microsoft Research Redmond. <laughs> you guys got some titles. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done, thanks for being here. Uh, Krista, I wanna start with you asking you to explain what a quantum computer is and how it's different from today's conventional computers. It sounds cool. It is cool. <laughs> yeah, a quantum computer is a next generation computing device uh, that we're working on building now, our, our colleagues and mm -hmm. the community is working on. And it revolves around uh, quantum mechanics. So it's based on quantum mechanics instead of classical mechanics. So instead of just bits of information, you have quantum bits of information. And these bits are you know, really special in that now you can take, instead of just a classical bit, which is a zero or a one value, you actually can take a, a superposition. Uh, that means it's simultaneously in the zero value and the one value at the same time. Mm. So you can imagine that this might give you some speed ups uh, because of the parallelism. You can compute on multiple values at the same time. Uh, wow. So this is you know, one piece. So superposition and entanglement are key pieces uh, to the quantum computer that we try to take advantage of when we design problems that we'll, we hope to solve with it. Okay, so I gotta go to my cheat sheet here. A quantum computer, basically uh, it would build transistors that could function in accordance with the quantum principles? Yeah, that's right. So, we, and it, it'll be a hybrid device that has a classical controller, a classical computer that's controlling the quantum computer. And then once you go into the quantum state, you do a bunch of operations, but it's quantum. We can't look at it. If we look at it, it's like Schrodinger's cat. It's dead and alive at the same time mm. until you open the box, and then it's dead or alive. Mm. Right? You've measured the state and collapsed it back to a classical system. So this quantum computing, uh, what happens is we initialize the quantum state, we send it through a bunch of quantum operations, and then at the end, we can actually look inside the box. Uh, and measure the system, and we get back classical information. This is also why it's hard to design problems for a quantum computer, mm -hmm. because you, you have to keep it isolated. You're not allowed to look at it while you're doing the computation, and at the end you can measure it and see, see a result. It'll collapse to one of the states. It doesn't remain in the superposition at the end. Okay, so I know for you guys, this is your area of expertise, uh, but for some of the folks watching, and certainly for me, bring us inside. Uh, Scott, what makes a qubit different from a regular bit? Okay, well, it's impossible to answer the question without saying a little bit about, I believe in you. about, about quantum mechanics. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, now quantum mechanics has this reputation for being complicated and hard. I mean, the secret is, it's actually incredibly simple once you take the physics out of it. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the key, I think, is the, to uh, um, this concept of superposition that Krista was just talking about, right? You might say, well, you know, to say that the bit is both zero and one at the same time, right, as, you know, uh, people always say, uh, you know, isn't that just a fancy way of saying that it's either zero or one and we just don't know which? And then, you know, you look at it and you see it's either a zero or a one, and now you know, right? What's so magical about that? Okay, the key is that... Uh, um, quantum mechanics, which was this you know, revolution in physics 100 years ago, sort of replaced the rules of probability uh, that we have to use by uh, some new, much more counterintuitive rules. Right? So normally, you, know, you might say there's a 30% or 50% chance of rain tomorrow. You'd never say there's a negative 30% chance. Right? That's just stupid. Okay? But uh, with quantum mechanics, uh, you have to, talk, you have to uh, talk about numbers called amplitudes instead of probabilities. Amplitude can be positive or negative. In fact, they can even be imaginary numbers. Okay, but now to you know now the rules define the probability that something is going to happen. Like your computer is going to give a particular answer when you look at it. You have to add up the amplitudes for all of the different ways that this could happen. Okay, and then you square the result. Okay, but the result of this is that if, if something could happen one way with a positive amplitude and another way with a negative amplitude, those two ways could cancel each other out so that the event never happens at all. 
Okay, and so qubits are bits that can exploit this principle of, it's called quantum interference, okay? And it's sort of the secret behind anything anyone ever tells you about the spookiness of the quantum world, right? It's all based on this, this one little trick of interference uh, over and over. And in particular, a quantum computer would be a computer that uses this interference effect in order to try to choreograph things so that, you know, for each possible wrong answer, you know, some of the paths leading there have positive amplitude, others have negative amplitude, so they cancel each other out. Whereas the paths that lead uh, to a right answer should have amplitudes that reinforce each other. Okay, so it's a very specialized kind of thing. You know, quantum computing is not a panacea that, you know, is going to let us solve every problem uh, uh, fast. There, there are some problems where a classical computer looks just as good. Okay, but, you know, for certain special problems, like finding the factors of enormous numbers, uh, you know, um, people have discovered remarkable ways to sort of exploit this magic of interference to solve it using a quantum computer much, much faster than we know how to solve it with any existing computer. Well, I love how you just make it sound so matter-of-fact. The kinds of things that I would see as a kid in a movie and go, oh, come on, <laughs> there's no way. Well, it's I, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Well, you want me to tell it like it is or, or, <laughs> yes, or like it no, isn't? Don't sugarcoat it. Uh, <laughs> so with all this speed, quantum computer could quickly compute the algorithm needed for deep space travel. But let's go back to kid movies. Leaving science fiction aside for a minute, what sort of things might a quantum computer do that today's conventional computers can't? Okay, so uh, I think the most fascinating thing is that it can actually solve the equations of quantum mechanics. So uh, is this so... Quantum mechanics is weird, it's difficult for a classical machine, and, and I still want to, to solve the equations because I want to make a quantum material with special properties. Mm -hmm. Superconduct, a new one, a new device. But in order to design it, I have to solve the equation of quantum mechanics. Mm. And on a classical computer, that's hard. And so the big uh, breakthrough there would be to just use quantum mechanics to solve the equations of the quantum mechanics. And that's what we could do to build the, 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 the computer that helps me find a new superconductor that that would be super conducting maybe be at room temperature and then we'd have a we'd have a transport of of electric power without loss or we find a new catalyst for turning nitrogen into fertilizer, or we could for look for a catalyst turning CO2 into carbonates. So kind of hard quantum chemistry questions, hard quantum physics questions mm -hmm. that we could solve with it, and that would help us then. All right, let's talk about some of the other areas, like improving encryption. Obviously, the beneficial everybody who uses their credit cards to purchase stuff. We all do it, most, most of us every day even. I can relate. Uh, are there other areas where quantum computers might be useful? I mean, obviously, it seems like a lot of other areas. So improve, you said improving encryption. The famous application of quantum computers is breaking encryption. Uh, breaking, you know, uh, most of the uh, encryption that people <laughs> use today to protect their credit card numbers, yeah. which, you know, uh, makes, you know, certain three-letter government agencies, you know, very interested in this field. But, uh, you know, you could say, uh, uh, maybe, you know, that, that's not really a sustainable application, right? People will just, it just means that when quantum computers become practical, people will have to switch to other cryptographic codes that are, that mm. are more secure against quantum attack. But, you know, so besides uh, quantum simulation, which Matthias mentioned, and which I think is a huge application area, maybe the most important one in practice if we ever get quantum computers, and cryptanalysis, which sort of makes the headlines for obvious reasons, I think there's a third very important one, which is, uh, you know, trying to solve optimization problems, like uh, scheduling airline flights, uh, uh, things of that nature. Now, for these problems, it's important to say we don't really know how much advantage you're going to get with a quantum computer. Okay. You know, you may get 
get a modest advantage. You know, you may, maybe you'll get a larger one. For the cryptanalysis and the quantum simulation, we're very confident that you'll get a huge advantage. So, I mean, is it possible or not to think that uh, quantum computers will replace traditional computers? Will my future oh. surface, th will this be full of qubits? No. You're, you're, you, you, I mean, no? you, you, don't, you don't need a quantum computer for playing Angry Birds or for checking your email, right? But think of the possibilities. Yeah, uh, right. I mean, I mean, people, you know, I mean, I mean, right. I mean, the counter argument would be people said back in the, you know, 1950s, well, you know, computers are great for science, but, you know, no one is ever going to need one in their home, right? So maybe in a hundred years from now, people will be playing quantum video games and They'll be doing all kinds of things that we can't even imagine today, right? All I can say is that as far as we can see today, this looks like a computer that would really push forward the boundaries of what we can do for certain specialized problems, scientific problems, right? At home, you might as well just have a classical computer and, you know, dial into the quantum computer, you know, like as part of a cloud when you need it for something. Mm -hmm. Right. In yeah. general, quantum computers now have to be you know, most, uh, most of the devices have to be very cold, so they sit in a huge dilution refrigerator, you know, as tall as, you know, this panel. I was going to say, the right? name it's even, not... quantum computer, makes me think it's in some remote forest in this giant <laughs> building. Forest. There's a man yeah, with yeah. gadgets yeah. and levers. And... It's, it's kind of like that. It's a huge right. refrigerator with a lot of graduate students and postdocs walking around, plugging things in, Steaming lowering things, things Is there that bubbly smoke yeah. coming out of it? And stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously there are special purpose devices, but, um, you know, quantum computers obviously will kind of be game changers. Um, you know, you, it does make me wonder how close you are to making a workable quantum computer. Okay. In time for Christmas? <laughs> Well, so, so a, 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 a quantum computer has been built, which is factored 15 into 3 times 5 with very high statistical confidence. Uh, and I, even 21 equals 3 times 7 has been done. So We have some quantum computers that <laughs> work. Yeah. Yeah. But they're just very, very small. Just small point, right? scale. Very, very, very scale. small. Very so. small. We need yeah. um, you know millions of qubits to do something interesting. Maybe in time we'll come up with yeah. algorithms that use you know ten thousand qubits to, and do something interesting. Um, but right now the size of these systems are maybe fourteen qubits. So if we need millions, we're mm -hmm. we're a ways away. But we hope that you know in particular at Microsoft we study something called topological qubits or topological quantum computation, and we hope there that the scaling once we have qubits in that system the scaling will be quite easy and we can reach the millions in a more, you know, an easier way than reaching the millions required in other devices, other quantum devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're looking at this, uh, you know, from many different yeah. directions, hoping that the scaling will, mm -hmm. will happen in the next maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. This is obviously just a, just a surface, not a quantum computer. But I can get emails on here, and actually uh, somebody just sent us a message, somebody watching online, uh, Scott, they've directed it right at you. <laughs> Are NP hard problems still NP hard with quantum computing, or more generally, how will the complexity theory, as we know, change? NP-hard problems, so I should clarify, this is a famous class of, uh, of hard problems that, you know, can, uh, uh, where, where you can sort of take uh, problems like the traveling salesman problem and map them onto these problems. That's what it means for them to be NP-hard. And uh, absolutely, the answer is yes. NP-hard problems are still, you know, uh, NP hard. Uh, that's just a, a, a mathematical concept, right? That doesn't even depend on physics, okay? But, you know, one of the, the basic uh, uh, questions that people ask, you know, when the ideas of quantum computing first started, you know, getting explored maybe 20 years ago was, could a quantum computer give you a fast way to solve these NP complete problems, okay? So, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there was, there was this remarkable quantum algorithm for factoring numbers and thereby for breaking much of the cryptography that we use that's based on, you know, the belief that that problem is hard. Uh, you know, there's also uh, algorithms for quantum simulation that Matthias mentioned. Okay, but, uh, uh, you know, both of those are fairly specialized tasks, right? And a real holy grail would be if you could find a fast quantum algorithm for these NP-complete problems, because this is, you know, encompasses actually tens of thousands of different practical problems all fall into this class. And, you know, many popular articles actually give the, the misperception that a quantum computer could do these just by trying every possible answer in parallel somehow, right? Now, the problem with that is that, you know, as Krista mentioned, at some point you've got to look at the computer, and when you look at it, you just get a single random answer, right? If you just wanted that, then, you know, you could have picked one yourself with much less trouble, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, no need for the giant dilution refrigerator, right? Um, 
So, you know, any hope for getting a quantum speed up relies on the magic of this interference effect. And um, unfortunately, after decades of research, we do not know how to use interference to get sort of an exponential speed up over a classical computer for solving these NP-complete problems. Okay, in special cases, uh, you, you may get an exponential speed up, uh, and you may get sort of a more modest speed up, you know, in, in general. We're not really sure. Uh, you know, it would help if we had a quantum computer to test things out with, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, so, so the, the bottom line is that quantum computing, you know, does change, you know, our picture of complexity theory in some very interesting ways. It pushes forward, you know, you might have thought that you could figure out a priori sitting in your armchair, you know, what is the right definition of, you know, efficiently computable. Uh, quantum computing comes along and says, no, you know, the laws of physics change that. You might have thought that factoring was, you know, a hard problem, but, you know, if you have a quantum computer, then it isn't. Okay, but on the other hand, and for these NP-complete problems, you know, not even a quantum computer seems to help. So even with a quantum computer, there seem to be uh, a very important limits to what you can do. There is a buzzword that has popped up, entanglement. Mm -hmm. We have not heard it mentioned yet. Oh, well, she mentioned it. I sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yes. Do people want to know? We got a question that came in about it. Um, circle back. People want to know about that. Well, entanglement is this, essentially this spooky action at a distance right. principle where we can entangle two qubits and then we can separate them, you know, uh, far, far apart. And if I act on this qubit, it is also acting on this qubit. These qubits are entangled, uh, you know, a bell pair or an EPR pair is an entangled state, and you separate them, you know, arbitrarily long distance, and whenever I do something here, it actually also occurs here, or it affects here. Well, we're running short on time here, uh, and this is a very complex thing. A um, couple of things I want to know. Number one, which I've sort of already tried to get out of you, uh, when do you suspect you could see a viable quantum computer. Mm -hmm. It Prototypes are out there, but... Right. It, it took more than 100 years from Charles Babbage until the invention of the transistor. I think that if we can beat that, then we're doing pretty well. I don't have that much time. <laughs> you know, well, so. unfortunately, you know, the problem is that sort of, you know, science doesn't move at media speed, right? This, right. Is, uh, this, this is the fundamental problem here, right? And people always want to know, well, how many qubits do you have so far, right? And, you know, I think that most of the scientists are focused on just getting two or three qubits that, you know, that really right. work. Right, and uh, you know we don't yet have sort of the quantum computing version of the transistor, right? The basic building blocks to scale up. You know, we're we're working on that, but you know, many times like heavier than air flight, right? People realize that something seems compatible with the laws of physics. You know, and it could be hundreds of years before the engineering catches up to that. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope that in twenty or thirty years, you know, in this case, that maybe you know we'll start seeing, if not full quantum computers, then at least ones that can really outperform classical computers. Computers, you know, in a right. fair comparison, you know, and in fact, there, there's a company that's been making claims to have these computers now. That remains highly disputed. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's you, it's easy to you know, or, or you know, you can build a device. You know, it can use quantum mechanics, but then you know, or, you know, I mean, everything involves quantum mechanics at a small enough scale, right? But then the real question is, are you actually doing something faster than you could do it with our existing computers? Right. And I think you know, maybe you know, hopefully, in twenty or thirty years, we'll be able to sort of, at least for some, maybe some special purpose problem that, you know, has no applications or that no one cares about, but at least show that we could do something faster than a classical computer could do it. Yeah, bonus yeah, points if you can get it done in the next 50 years while I'm around. All right. Well, be we'll fun for me yeah. to see we'll, we'll, it. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the experimentalists yeah. to get working on it harder. Just yeah. put in a note. Um, unfortunately, yeah. we don't have a quantum computer here in the studio. We could have used it to suspend time. We cannot, <laughs> so we must march on. Uh, we have run out of time. Uh, thanks to my guest, uh, Krista, Matthias, Scott. Thank you guys. Uh, rather mind-swelling uh, discussion there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you much.